Welcome to Education Matters presented by the Public School Forum of North Carolina. I'm your host, Tom Williams. On May 2nd, the North Carolina General Assembly approved a pandemic relief package nearing $1.6 billion in two bills. This action leaves nearly $2 billion of federal stimulus funds for the next phase of funding priorities by the General Assembly. After compromising, votes in the House and the Senate were unanimous in passing the first COVID-19 recovery package. Here to discuss the intended impacts of this funding are Representative Craig Horn and Senator Don Davis. Also to discuss key decisions and emerging priorities of the State Board of Education is Freebird McKinney, the State Board's Director of Legislative Affairs and Community Outreach. I'd like to welcome to the show Freebird McKinney. Uh, thank you for joining us today. And we know that this is your first time uh, on Ed Matters since you've assumed your new role with the State Board of Education. It is. Thank you very much for having me today. It's good to see you again. Um, so, Mr. McKinney, tell us what has kind of actions as the State Board of Education been taken over the most recent weeks in light of the COVID and uh, the school closures and the move to remote learning? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, as we all are aware of it, it's been uh, such a dynamic environment to respond in. And I think there's been uh, a real great collaborative effort between DPI, between the State Board of Education, between voices in the field um, to really answer the call in this unprecedented time in our state's history and, and quite honestly in, in, in our uh, country and globe's history. Um, and what was done is they, we put together a series of working groups. Uh, and these working groups range from grading and graduation policy to operations, child nutrition, transportation, um, remote learning, re-entry, policy and legislation, funding, all the way down to calendar and, and professional development. So what those groups have done is they've provided uh, some great feedback uh, and then building out policies so the state board can then look at them and approve them. I think a great example of this has been the grading policy. It's been led by Dr. David Stegall and Sneha Shah Coltrane, and what they did is they, they collaborated, took a lot of very uh, perspectives from around the state, stakeholder input, and they build out a, a policy that truly reflects um, the, the, the issues of the remote learning uh, and, and digital teaching, uh, the gap, I guess, the digital gap, uh, and also really, I, I think, focused on how do we build the best equitable learning environment and then use grades to then assess what's going on to provide grace and patience in that process, but also to validate the efforts of the students, the families, the teachers, and the support staff during this remote teaching experience. And I, and I feel like that's such a great example. Then they lifted that up. They've also, we've also looked at driver's ed. Um, tomorrow we'll look at competency-based learning. Uh, we've looked at um, graduation uh, requirements and, and also leave time policy. So these working groups have really been able to provide a collaborative uh, uh, force to, to lend up, to, to lift up these ideas so that the board can then uh, vote on them. Very good. Um, well, we know that um, it's a large task ahead of everybody and the state board has spent time really prioritizing what their budget proposals mm -hmm. would be. Can you talk a little bit about their framework around budgeting? Yeah, absolutely. So this, uh, these four buckets, so to speak, that we focused on primarily uh, are obviously emergency COVID-19 relief needs um, versus maybe an overall North Carolina public school uh, need base. Um, this was also done in strong collaboration with DPI working groups, with uh, legislative team, with the governor's office, General Assembly and their working groups, um, and, and particularly the, the House Select Committee on Education. And what it did is it focused on the, the State Board of Education's commitment to delivering that equitable opportunity to each and every student in North Carolina, really trying to, to practice that, uh, ensuring our students are treated in a fair and just manner. And so the four buckets uh, that we decided primarily on in that initial phase were child nutrition and really working on the lack of uh, reimbursement and receipt base from the time that schools shut down to the end of the school year. Um, and uh, in the most recent bill that was given 75 million um, to also look at uh, essential worker uh, pay as well. Uh, student support services was another bucket that we focused on. We know 
there's going to be some tremendous social and emotional uh, challenges, not only during this period, but also as we end the school year, transition into summer, and then move into the reentry period. Um, we wanted to focus on EC uh, to make sure that uh, all of our students are being provided that just and, and fair um, remote learning and teaching opportunity. Uh, so this could be extended services or future services. Um, the Jumpstart program, which we feel is going to be a, a huge bonus for our students. I mean, we're looking at almost a six month time lapse between March 13th and when we're uh, looking to, to, um, to begin school again. So how do we provide that Jumpstart particular for our rising uh, first graders through fourth graders, as well as Math 1? and provide that, I mean, that, that essential core instruction for a couple of weeks before uh, the, the regular school year starts, bridge that, that digital divide, also uh, really address the, the, the typical summer melt that exists. Uh, and then lastly, the remote teaching and learning resources, really try to build that up from connectivity pieces to device pieces, but also uh, in bridging um, more districts to the Canvas learning uh, platform, uh, and, and also uh, looking at cybersecurity. I think these are going to be concerns that as we move a little bit more to providing remote teaching uh, and learning, you know, how can we address this needs uh, right now and then build on to remote instruction plans and summer learning plans. Thank you. Um, I think uh, those budget priorities and trying to keep the clarity around them, the focus uh, in this initial response is critical. Um, as you know, prior to the pandemic, the state board was working very diligently with the uh, plaintiffs on the Leandro case and looking at the court order from Judge Lee that has been put on hold appropriately so during the, this pandemic time. But um, what conversations has the state board been having to still make sure that that critical constitutional obligation is being met and perhaps supported through this recovery process? It, and, th and this is the, the essence of our board strategic plan. Uh, you know, it is to, our objective one is to eliminate opportunity gaps uh, and to build it through that uh, educational equity lens. Um, the inequities have been exasperated though, and, and, and exacerbated, excuse me. And I, I feel like the, the seven critical components uh, in this action plan that we are developing not only are they continuing to be brought up and raised in conversations, but they're lifting up these core objectives of our strategic plan with that whole child focus. Um, I mean, the first one, I think the teachers have done such an incredible job uh, in, in bridging um, from that March 13th point to the daily instruction that they're providing. So continue the importance of maintaining that system of teacher and principal development and recruitment. I think it's gonna be crucial how are we working with our EPPs to, to continue that process as well? Um, the funding piece, I think we, we just discussed the importance of that adequate, that equitable and that predictable funding piece that the Leandro is asking that plan to be based on. Um, not to mention the necessary support to, our, to all of our schools, but particularly the, the uh, low performing schools and districts that are highlighted in, in that report. And then lastly, uh, and I think uh, Senate Bill 704 and, and House Bill 1043 also address this, is the accountability system and the assessment pieces um, that we're using to, uh, to assess our students. Currently, a lot of those are gonna be waived for this year, but moving forward, how do we reassess how we assess our students? So these conversations are constantly lifted up. They, they drive our, our strategic plan um, and, and I believe the boards uh, ultimate priorities still rest in a lot of these uh, uh, these conversations. Closing thought on the top priority moving forward for the state board. Chairman Davis and his uh, in his talk the other day, uh, following the governor's announcement, kind of laid out a three stage, a response stage for our students and teachers, continuing child nutrition or remote teaching and learning for the teachers to really build on those social emotional community strengths in their classes, to build on uh, professional development for remote teaching and learning. And then as we move into more of a readiness stage to work on this Jumpstart Learning Program, more uh, partnerships with our local youth serving organizations, school improvement planning and, and further that PD piece. 
And then lastly, what the whole entire state is really focusing on over these next few weeks is what does this reentry stage look like? Thank you so very much. I can't think of a better way to end a Teacher Appreciation Week than having these insights from you as one of our state teachers of the years. Thank you so much. After the break, we'll be joined by Representative Craig Horn and Senator Don Davis to update us on education funding. Education Matters is brought to you each week in part by Town Bank, serving others, enriching lives. now our representative Craig Horn from uh, the House of Representatives here in North Carolina and Senator Don Davis. Uh, we're delighted to have both of you gentlemen here and thank you for being with us. Thank you very much for having us. Absolutely. Let me begin by congratulating you and your colleagues on such a successful and a collaborative short session that adjourned last Saturday uh, and in particular uh, the bills that allowed you to uh, identify about one and a half billion dollars of new federal funds to help address some of the immediate needs uh, that we're facing in our state in light of uh, the Corona virus and uh, through the CARES Act funding. Um, it leaves a balance of money and reserves are still eligible to be funded in the next go around of about $2 billion. And we're just kind of wondering, can you share with us how you decided as a House and the Senate to kind of use this two-phase approach to use of those federal funds? Well, first I'd like to start by saying welcome back. And by that, I mean, welcome back. Our money that went to Washington DC is coming back to us. That's, <laughs> that's very welcome. So welcome home money. Uh, <laughs> certainly, uh, Tom, we began this process by focusing very narrowly on what are the most urgent, most immediate needs. We recognize that where we're going to be longer term needs and that new things would come up as we proceeded down this path of dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. So let's start with first things first. What are the most important things that we have to do? Most immediate needs to be filled and, and be cognizant of the fact that there will be new things coming along. So let's walk down the hill rather than run down the hill and fall all over our own feet. Very good. Senator Davis, how about your thoughts? Absolutely. Um, when we came back, and I must admit that there were um, concerns about coming back and how we would literally carry out the session. Um, so there were a lot of things taking place. And what I believe that was really important was our ability to work together and how we would work together. Um, there's a public health and economic crisis before us. And this is the time that I believe um, residents want us to come together. The house had early on began to put together working um, groups. And on the Senate side, we were working with our oversight chairs. Uh, there were, was a lot of communication going back and forth, especially on the Senate side. And then um, there was a lot of communication that was taking place across chambers. Um, so I, I do commend um, the efforts that went into this um, to extend the communication to really work for the greater good. Great. Along that line, if you don't mind, Tom, I would like to, to point out that, that and give kudos to uh, Speaker Tim Moore, who created this COVID-19 Select uh, Committee very bipartisan. Uh, in the beginning, there were more than 50, I think close to 60 House members. On, and then he broke the, uh, the committee into work groups. Uh, as you know, I'm one of the three chairmen of the education work group, along with Representative Fraley, a Republican from Iredell County, and Representative Ashton Clemens, a Democrat from, uh, from Guilford County. The synergies were incredible. We came together with a singular focus on our most immediate needs and, a, and an absolute commitment to working not just across the aisle, but across the chambers and across the state to get an incredible amount of input so that we made decisions that were good for the entire state, not just good for some people in their districts or, or some particular uh, agenda that they might bring to the party. 
Very good. And, and I would also convey to um, President Pro Tem Berger, I'm working again with oversight chairs, um, Senator Deanna Ballard. Um, we all came together again on the Senate side. It was a different approach, but at the end of the day, I believe it's one um, that work in terms of being able to come together and, and just take care of the needs of our students. Right. Sure. Well, I, I think I'm correct that originally the House had about 291 million in there for education and the Senate had 148 and you all worked hard those three days and, and landed at about 231 million for education. How about from the Senate and House side, a couple of the key most important um, budget priorities that you all saw need to be addressed? One of the things that I think was important, when you look at those earlier proposals, even from the Senate, there was not a lot of movement, early movement in the Senate side in terms of the appropriations, but there were two things in particular that stand out to me. One was supporting our school nutrition program. Um, I want to uh, pause and commend all of our non-certified, those bus drivers, um, cafeteria workers, who've been working hard, going overtime above and beyond um, to get meals out to our students and especially during this time of need. Uh, we agreed on this. We agreed uh, that not only was it important to continue the program, but uh, to provide supplemental um, um, salaries for these individuals who's getting it, who've been working hard to get it done every day. Um, that's huge. The other thing that was key that we agreed on early was the need for some sort of summer learning program. Uh, there were some different approaches discussed in terms of a summer learning program versus a jump start type initiative. But either way, I believe we landed um, at a place to um, give our LEAs an opportunity to really shape this and respond to the needs now that we understand that may exist with our students as a result of this. On the House side, we too uh, were very keenly aware of the challenges in school nutrition. Uh, I came from a food service background. I did a lot of school food service and recognized that often uh, school lunch, school breakfast are the only good meals a kid might get in a given day or in a given week. So we felt a lot of pressure to ensure that we continue to be able to provide uh, nutritious meals to our students to the greatest extent possible. But we also took a very uh, student-centered approach to what was going on with learning. It, we've got actually close to 2 million students across North Carolina that for all practical purposes have not been in school since the first week of March. I mean, the learning loss, the education loss is just awful. And kids that were behind before, now they're even further behind. So we, we took a, a, a very circumspect look at how can we improve the delivery of a quality education, not busy work, not supplemental education, but how are we going to raise our kids up and help them be successful as they move on forward, knowing that they're missing a big chunk of instructional time. We've got a couple minutes left, and I, and I know that both of you have been heavily involved with the uh, where the state was in trying to become Leandro compliant for sound basic education by all students, uh, especially our most vulnerable at risk students. How do you see the impact of uh, the pandemic uh, be the, either being a driver of helping us move in that or a barrier to moving towards that? Well, on one hand, it is, uh, the pandemic has, has, set us, has set us back in equity and of opportunity, not equality, but equity because it's our poorest and most rural kids that don't have either the connectivity or the devices. And those are the kids that need the help the most. So it has really shown a light on that, uh, on that piece that, and I think will drive the agenda of the, of the general assembly. I hope will drive it further as we move into the, into our traditional short session. On the other hand, it's also, challenged us more greatly to pay attention to really recognize that 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 gap that learning gap that's now been applied needs special help i mean really needs it now more than ever and, senator and david you've got about one minute left let's hear your thoughts on it and i'll 
don't say especially being from Eastern North Carolina, I understand that there was a gap that existed before COVID. And now what the um, task is, is with COVID, um, these funds and resources we put in place is to try to eliminate the extent that that gap widens during this period of time. So um, Representative Horn, I think is exactly correct. We have to continue to assess what's on the ground, provide the resources that are necessary um, um, to eliminate um, those gaps that, that exist. Um, I come from a community in um, you know, Greene County that we were able to early on put um, laptops in the hands of students to alleviate a digital divide. I think it's now more than ever that we have to eliminate these divides that may exist. So right. we'll continue to pay attention to Leandro moving forward. Smartly right. is the key, how we move smartly. We are, we are so grateful to both of you for being here today, uh, but more importantly, what you and your colleagues in the General Assembly do every day, looking out for the people of North Carolina and wish you well as you move forward into reconvening around COVID recovery on May 18th, and we'll be coming back and circling back with you. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. No, thank you. And to the Public School Forum. We appreciate it. After the break, this week's final word. In times of catastrophic circumstances, strong state leadership, targeted infusion of funding, and alignment of essential resources are critical. How well and how quickly our state leaders respond to such extreme circumstances affects both the impact and effectiveness of our state's path towards recovery. Last Saturday, after having been in session for only three days, our House and Senate of the North Carolina General Assembly moved quickly and reached agreement on the first phase of its appropriations of the $3.5 billion Federal CARES Act stimulus dollars that were allocated to North Carolina to address the COVID-19 pandemic. By meeting somewhere near the middle of the House and Senate areas of priorities and initial funding levels, just over $1.5 billion of critical federal stimulus funding will target essential programs and services to meet the most pressing needs of individuals and institutions at the state level, as well as in local communities in all corners of North Carolina. Currently, our General Assembly plans to reconvene on May 18th to discuss next steps related to the COVID response, and the top of their to-do list will be reaching agreement on the critical decision of how to best invest the remaining balance of nearly $2 billion in the COVID-19 federal stimulus funds. Like the first phase, the K-12 public school funding needs and key policy decisions moving forward must reflect a strong team and collaborative effort by Governor Cooper, the State Board of Education, the State Superintendent, the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction, and our General Assembly. Through the state-led COVID-19 education and nutrition working groups, the important voices of diverse stakeholders must be heard and considered so funding and policy decisions will have the greatest impact on the most students and communities. As a foundation for these critical decisions, we implore our state leaders to intentionally align these important decisions in meeting its constitutional obligation and current court order issued by Judge David Lee for every student in North Carolina, especially those identified as most vulnerable, to receive a sound basic education. That's it for this week's show. Thanks for watching and we'll see you soon.